In this video, we're going to talk about the implications and ramifications of the COVID-19 on our daily lives. We're going to talk about some of the ways that we're erasing impacts and some things that will probably likely happen in the future because of this particular virus. If you have any feedback at any time, post that in the comments section below. So let's go ahead and jump in. Recently, the World Health Organization warned the world to brace for a pandemic from the COVID-19 virus. Before that, Apple asked its investors to expect lower quarterly revenue as a result of the slowdown of Chinese manufacturing. Moody's has slashed auto manufacturing and sales forecasts for the next economic quarter. The Dow plunged over 3,000 points in just five days as a result. The signs are everywhere that COVID-19 is already threatening economies around the world, but these are the most obvious ways a potential pandemic can affect the world. There are more subtle and impactful economic ways it can impact our day-to-day -day lives. Many American workers cannot afford to take too much time off work. With the long asymptomatic period of this virus and the symptomatic phase, workers in hospitality, food services, manufacturing, transport, education, childcare, even your local supermarket could be all working and unknowingly spreading the virus. Large-scale panic about the potential of a pandemic or even small clusters of outbreaks in cities across the nation could grind businesses you rely on to a halt. Imagine an outbreak in your city. How many people would be brave enough to go to a restaurant to eat, to the movies, to school, or to a crowded office? When fewer people are shopping, eating out, and going to events, businesses do not need as many workers, nor as many products they are unable to sell. This causes a reduction in what is termed the velocity of money. Essentially, money does not travel as far, nor does it buy as much. The dollar a person might pay for food was prepared by someone who was paid, someone profited from the sale, someone bought more raw materials to prepare the food, a farmer or baker got paid for their work, and so on and so on. The dollar is said to have velocity. Pieces of it are paying a great number of people. In a pandemic, however, the velocity slows. The dollars don't travel as far, and that's just the economics of it. But a pandemic will have more micro effects on you and your family. If you work hourly in an industry that requires customers coming through the door, would your hours be reduced to match reduced traffic? What is your plan when your child's daycare provider or school temporarily closes in an effort to stop the spread of the virus? Would you be able to take time off work to tend to your children? If you are in a position to work from home a few days per week, this may be the time to suggest it to your employer. Preparing to be safe can involve just reducing your possible exposure to the virus by staying at home. More importantly though, in a significant economic downturn, it's important that you have the beginnings of a plan in place. These key conversations with your employer or asking your school what their plan is should things become worse can all prepare you to weather the pandemic storm. Remember, we plan to fail when we fail to plan. The second hidden danger of the COVID-19 is a possible disruption of services and scarcity of products you rely upon. Number two, understand what services and products you rely on. Should the pandemic worsen, you need to understand what services and products you rely upon and make sure that you can survive for an extended period of time without them. Not only is the scarcity of product a possibility, you don't want to be forced into a situation where you absolutely have to leave your safe home to seek out a product you fail to adequately have on hand. The CDC issued a warning that it expects that coronavirus is spread in the U.S. and that Americans should prepare themselves for significant disruption in their daily lives. Further guidance from the CDC suggested that Americans prepare as they would for a storm with regards to food supplies and possible interruption of services. The world doesn't have a tremendous amount of experience in managing a pandemic, so we're a little bit in uncharted territory here. While I don't suggest you sequester yourself and max out your credit cards buying gear and supplies, I do suggest that you understand your interactions and needs from the world and make sure you have a supply of those things you rely upon. The easiest way to do this may be to review several months of your banking and spending habits. What you spend your money on is also what you have some dependency on. Did you eat out? If you did, ask yourself, am I prepared to make my meals at home? Maybe picking up a large jar of peanut butter, the case of ramen noodles, or the case of canned flavored waters would be a good idea. Some honey, which has an incredibly long shelf life, can provide you with needed sugars or could be used as a natural cough suppressant. Once a pandemic has passed, you could use it in your food or drinks. The easiest way to build a supply of foods is with food you will eat. If nothing happens or this doesn't spiral out of control, you can easily cycle through your extra supplies in the months after the pandemic threat has subsided. There are other services you should consider though. Here again, you can assess these by what you commonly pay for. Do you pay a cable or internet bill? If you did, ask yourself if you have the printed materials you need to properly care for a sick individual should there be an interruption to electrical or internet services. Like most people, you probably turn to Google when you are sick or your child is sick. 
you know the proper treatment methods to reduce fever, increase fluids, or stop diarrhea and vomiting? Do you have that homeopathic recipe you used for cough suppression last time you were sick? Or the instructions to make that sterilizing solution you made from vinegar? You may want to print a few web articles from credible sites to have them on hand in case electrical or internet services are disrupted. Trash, electrical, water, gas, all services you pay for. What is your plan should one of these services be interrupted due to a pandemic, civil rest, or a declaration of martial law, or some other interruption of service? Having multiple flashlights and batteries on hand may be a lifesaver in an extended power outage. Having an alternate method to get rid of your garbage may help you keep your environment contaminant free. Do you have pets that you buy food for every month? This may be a good time to spring for that 30 pound bag of dog food or the 16 pound bag of cat food. Essentially, think about the purchases you make on a regular basis. Determine your needed supplies and prepare yourself, as the CDC says, for a coming storm. Maybe the most important impact the coronavirus may have is on the medicine supply. The potential that the coronavirus may have on the medical supply system in America is very important to point out here. And I want to really emphasize this with this third point regarding medicine. Number three, medicines could be in a short supply. One of the lessons we learned from Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico is that everyday common medical supplies can swiftly come in short supply. Baxter International, the main supplier of saline to 50% of U.S. hospitals, suffered major damage to their facilities in that devastating hurricane. Saline is simply salt water, but proper manufacturing practices are required to keep it sterile and free from particulate matter. Severe prescription drug shortages have become a major threat to public health and patient safety. The first medical procedure someone suffering from an extreme case of the flu would undergo is a saline drip to restore hydration levels. It's not just saline that would become in short supply, however. China, still the epicenter of COVID-19, approaching over 90,000 infected people, at least what they're reporting, is a major supplier of active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. These APIs are key ingredients in many generic medications used to treat the flu. Cough and cold medicines, stomach medicines, anti-diarrheal medicines, pain relievers, fever reducers, vitamins, and any prescription medicines should be well stocked. You will not only want them should a pandemic break out and someone in your family falls ill, but you will also want them because the available supply in stores will drop due to reduced manufacturing and store selling out of products. You do not want to wait until you have symptoms before you purchase ibuprofen to reduce your temperature. Not only are a thousand people with actual symptoms trying to purchase that for their own relief, but supplies could dry up from reduced manufacturing or from healthy people preparing as you are. When there are runs on stores for common food products, that should be also the time that you make sure your medicine cabinets are well stocked. While others are buying beans, rice, and ramen noodles to wait out potentially long periods of time at home, you should be stocking up on medicines needed to treat the flu. Of course, you will wanna get any prescriptions filled so you have any personally needed medicines on hand. Other medicines, however, we typically don't think about until we actually need them. Uh, you're not going to want to have to find them when they're in high demand and reduce availability. Typically, we go to the store for over-the-counter fever medicines when we feel the onset of a cold or fever, or should someone we love comes down with a cold or fever. If you're like me, when my child shows signs of being sick, I have to make a run to the store to stock up on a few items. These are the items you want to make sure you have on hand now. Those are the items which we will see a run on in stores, and those are the items that will be in short supply. With a looming pandemic, it's important that we go through our medicine cabinets and check the expiration and quantities of the medicines we have left over from the last time someone was sick and fill in the gaps of medicines we may still need. As you assess your medicine cabinet, keep expiration dates and quantities. Do you have enough medicine on hand to fight the common symptoms of the flu virus? A fever reducer like ibuprofen or Tylenol will also fight aches and pains. Anti-diarrheal medicine and a stomach ache medicine may be needed. What cough suppressant liquids do you have on hand? Saline nose drops or a neti pot can help to restore breathing and flush mucus from the body. Mucinex may also help. This is not an endorsement of any of these specific brands as much as intended to make you aware of the general over-the-counter medicines you should have on hand. The symptoms of a virus can last from two days to two weeks. As a general rule, you may want to have 10 days of dosages or should your household fall ill. For instance, if a medicine to relieve symptoms is suggested to be administered every six hours, a sick person will need four doses for maybe 10 days. Multiply that 40 doses by half the number of people in your household. Hopefully not everyone in your household will become ill for a full 10 days, but this method will make certain you have a decent supply of medicines on hand for an extended period of time. Again, we typically don't think of the medicines we need until we actually need them. 
We don't want to have to find them when they are in high demand or reduce availability. In a future video, I'll discuss a few of the essentials you may need for an extended pandemic that you may or may not have already thought of initially. You want to make sure you have enough supplies to last one month or more. The fourth danger isn't medicine shortages as much as it is everyday products we may take for granted. Number four, run stores for traditional emergency supplies. If you've been following my channel for any period of time, probably prepared a food and water storage sufficient to get you and your family through at least several months at a minimum. If there does appear to be a larger outbreak and there are runs on stores that people panic to stock up and do the same, you should focus on getting secondary items and perishable items you'll need like medicines, paper and hygiene products, garbage bags, and the like. The symptoms of a virus can last from two days up to two weeks. And you should plan now as if you will be sick for an extended period of time beginning tomorrow. You can do this by making sure the products you have on hand are usable later should the pandemic pass you by. This makes sure you don't have things that will go to waste, but you are well stocked with the essentials you need. You also want to make sure that you have tissues, an electrolyte restoring drink, and foods that you can eat that are light on your stomach. Bananas, rice, applesauce, and bread for toast are the foods in what is called the brat diet. In a situation where someone has a full-blown fever, these are foods that are easy on the stomach when you need to get nutrients, but you can't stomach more complex foods. So make sure you have these items on hand. There isn't likely to be a run on bananas or applesauce at your store just yet, but you can be prepared should the pandemic worsen by having extra bananas on hand. If you don't become sick, ramen noodles, Pedialyte, Gatorade, and other long shelf life, high caloric and restorative foods can get you through a long period of time if you're confined at your home. While others are making a run on rice and beans, make sure you have extra containers of peanut butter or pickles and other items that you would normally have in your diet that are things that you can store that are non-perishable. Others may not be thinking of these items, but they can sustain you for a long period of time should staying in your home become essential. Having a supply of toilet paper, paper towels, tissues, sanitary wipes, hygiene products, distilled vinegar, a large bottle of bleach so you can make your own wipes, an empty spray bottle, disposable or dishwashing gloves, protective masks, garbage bags, and other things you will need to keep your environment as safe from the virus as possible. Should one of your family members or you become sick with a virus, you'll be glad you took the extra step in stocking up. If you're new to this channel, I've made other videos about what you should be storing for events like this. In a full-blown pandemic with a large rate of community spread, these products could disappear from shelves very rapidly, and you don't want to be in a situation where you have to compromise your safety by venturing out into the world to try and track one of these products down. This brings us to our final and the potentially worst hidden danger of the virus, the possibility of civil unrest, riots, and martial law. Number five, civil unrest, riots, and martial law. In a pandemic situation, it's important to realize that civil arrests, looting, and other forms of lawlessness may be more of a threat to your personal safety than the virus itself. When people panic, they are essentially triggered into violent or explosive overreactions. You should remain vigilant and aware of the civil unrest. Oftentimes, civil unrest is confined to a specific area and grows out from that epicenter. Be prepared to move in the opposite direction of an actively violent or destructive area. Make certain that you know more than one route to any destination and have a plan in place to gather your family together. Be prepared to leave work if you live in a metropolitan area. Be prepared to pull your kids out of school. Coordinate with your spouse or partner to determine the responsibilities during a crisis situation. Hopefully you will never need to implement an emergency route, but if you do, you'll be glad you had adequately prepared. Make sure that your plan does not rely on your use of cellular phones. Often, after earthquakes here in Southern California, cell services are overloaded with people contacting friends and family to check in on their safety and ask if they felt it. Should you get a message that lines are busy, remember that text messages may go through when calls will not. To be the safest, however, make sure you have a plan in place should civil unrest occur. Should a pandemic be declared, it's critical to understand that governments acting in an overabundance of caution may take drastic measures to restrict your freedom or mobility and your access to critical places. In China, for instance, entire cities and regions were quarantined. With only a few instances of stores being looted or general lawlessness, a state of martial law could be declared. Under martial law, constitutional freedoms and liberties are suspended. Governments impose measures through military force. Even one instance of looting could lead to a declaration of martial law. Probably the safest place in an urban environment is within your own home or apartment. The lower your profile and the more prepared you are, the less likely you are to need to venture out and risk possible separation from your family. Travel restrictions, including road closures, quarantine zones, and curfews are all possibilities during a state of martial law brought on because of a full-blown pandemic. If a pandemic where martial law has been declared, you should view your home as your own quarantine zone, leaving only when it is essential that you know that it is safe to do so. 
In a general outbreak and pandemic, you may be still required to go to work or school or to interact publicly. Public interaction is sometimes essential and it is ill-advisable to sequester yourself with every occurring flu outbreak. In a state of martial law or during explosive periods of civil unrest, however, you should definitely try and remain your home at all times, as you should, as I mentioned earlier, have worst case scenario plans in place. Just to sum up this video, the first is that this pandemic could lead to a larger global recession. Reduced productivity, lost work hours, revised forecasts can all slow down the wheels of commerce and impact our household incomes. Secondly, to survive this or any other pandemic, you need to make sure you know what services and products you rely upon. Now is the time to review your spending and determine what you would have a hard time living without. Third, realize before everyone else does that medicines may become in short supply. Make certain you have over-the-counter medicines you need before you need them. Fourth, prepare a potential run on grocery stores, stock up on items not typically thought of when people are preparing for a long-term larger shutdown. Fortunately, we know what we're fighting against here, so we're able to focus a little more clearly on what we need instead of trying to protect and prepare against unknown threats. Finally, watch for hot spots and signs of civil unrest. People sometimes lose themselves in frantic and panic situations. Keeping yourself and your family safe from a stampede is critical to your survival. If you found this video informative and helpful, please feel free to like and share it with your friends, family, and community. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to share, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. I read many of the comments and respond to them when I'm able to do so, usually within the first hour of releasing the video. Remember, there are links in the description section below where you can find more information about things I discuss in this video. If you want to be notified when other videos become available, please feel free to subscribe to this channel. As always, be safe out there.